that because for some reason that's not working. So I just want to just really quickly to sort of set the the stage of who I am. You know, you're sort of like, well, okay, yeah, introduction, but you don't know where I'm coming from and, and why this particular topic is relevant. So I'm an associate professor in, of design in the multidisciplinary design program. I started that program about 10 years ago uh, as a vehicle to think about exactly what we're talking about, the convergence of design, engineering, and business, and to take research ideas, sort of abstract concepts that, you know, one might have, and then move them all the way through the university system, obtaining research funding, and then translating them into a market. And we've done it in a variety of different places uh, with about, uh, well, we have eight patents. We've done it across those different eight patents, and we've started five companies. Uh, and then currently, I'm also uh, a senior associate dean in undergraduate studies. And these are just some examples of some work that I'll show. The, the main work that I've done is in software development and uh, representation of complex information. So I think the first thing is I just want to sort of like, why is this important in this concept of research and why is design thinking uh, really this important topic. And to start off, I'll just give you a definition of design, uh, which is different than maybe some of the research activities that you've been engaged in before, but it's really this tangible creative manifestation of an idea through an intentional process that is to be consumed by humans that blends the emotional and cultural with scientific and rational. So it's really at the intersection of sort of the standard research work that goes on in an institution and then this other sort of area of making product that people actually want to use that solve a particular problem. Uh, and, and our program does that work. The reason that this is really relevant I think for my work, for what you all are interested in, as well as an institution and thinking about research in a little bit different way, is that the world today is radically different than it was 20, 30, 50 years ago. And I mean that by the, it's ever changing. So from one day to the next, entire systems are being challenged, uprooted, modified, disrupted. Uh, and, and there's not much control that we have. The traditional power structures and control systems that we've had uh, are not proving effective. And so we're having to modify. The, the classic example of this is the, you know, the last two years during the pandemic where we had something that was out of our control that disrupted the entire world, set us on a path of a shared experience uh, that was really, uh, you know, the undocumented in the history of time uh, as far as its profound effect on, on life and the way that we think of control systems. The other part of this is the world is incredibly distributed and, uh, less top-down, again, disrupting these traditional power structures that have been in place where you often have some sort of hierarchy. The, the world is moving to a much more distributed system where individuals have power and control over certain pieces, but that then is being linked to other power structures and linked together through networks. And you know, it's really been facilitated at a rapid rate by the internet, which has changed the way we thought about uh, the world. And it really is the way that we've thought about information as well as power structure. And then that it's all very relational and it meaning that it's connected uh, via these interests and activities and less sort of controlled and gone through one intermediary, right? It, you can kind of search and, and in this world, the relationships are much more important than the power structure. So I say that 
in the sense that this is also disrupting a lot of what we do in education and these traditional ways that we deliver uh, the way that we think about what the value is of an education. You all are interested in looking at doing research and developing a particular idea, but then continuing that on and moving that out into the marketplace. I would say traditionally and historically, education has not done that much. Uh, there have always been pockets of it, but we're seeing more and more people who are really looking at doing research that then has a tangible manifestation and an impact out in the world. Does that make sense? Because a lot of the stuff that we're doing is very esoteric, but through community engagement, through all sorts of different forms of new research, including tech commercialization and others, it is to take that and put it into some form that then has an impact in the world beyond an artifact of a, of a paper, these traditional things in education. And, and we're seeing students are much more interested in this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this much, but again, you may be sort of like, okay, this is a research activity. Uh, you, you're doing undergraduate research, and how is this sort of discussion of this broader world uh, connected with that? I hit on it a little bit, but I, I want to do some basic foundation that will sort of uh, help you think about this conceptually. So in this broadest sense of research, right, is it includes the gathering of data and information and facts for the advancement of knowledge. Now, that's its artifact, the advancement of knowledge. So that means the currency that education environments create is the advancement of knowledge, which oftentimes is in the form of papers, some sort of study, some Thing that just pushes out we have new knowledge uh, and not necessarily that that information has much impact until it's translated by someone into something right so that's that's kind of the traditional way of looking at it and in that way it is this methodological study to prove a hypothesis or answer a scientific question the the age-old scientific method uh, crops in here. It's a way of knowing the world. It's a way of examining, describing, and knowing the world, which then I would argue in some ways keeps this translation of into things that have impact. It keeps it sort of as a secondary consideration because all we're doing is a way of knowing and describing that way of knowing. So you'll find traditional research as being very critical, very focused, uh, reductionist, uh, trying to understand things in isolation, which is different than what I'll kind of describe this, this other activity that you all are interested in. And so to give you a sense of this, I, I just want to sort of base it in this concept of reasoning, right? This, this is something that we all do and that is really sort of the, what is the activity that's going on in our brain of how we think about this world. And scientific reasoning is a little bit different than design reasoning, which I'll explain and, and this production of things. But it's really just, you have a what and a, and a how that leads to a result. And so all scientific investigation and what we traditionally call as research is to get to this, right? We observe something, we try to understand its working principle, or we try to understand the result, we make some conclusions about that, we see the repeatability, and then we put it out in the world as a new form of knowledge. And we have two forms within the standard way that you all have learned primarily through our education system, which is we have deductive reasoning. All right, deductive reasoning is I have I, I, I want to, I have a thing, I have a tree, and I have a working principle of how that tree works. It grows, it, it has photosynthesis, it has all these other types of characteristics, which lead me to an observed phenomenon that helps me describe how trees grow, 
and what they do in the world. Right. Is that, so, so that's kind of a very traditional way, and that's called deductive reasoning. That is kind of the foundation of scientific exploration, and it's a traditional way that we see research. The other way is inductive reasoning. We have a what, we have a tree, we see the results of this growth pattern, but we're trying to observe it to see the working principle. What, what is it that's driving this tree to grow in this particular way? Is it because of sunlight? Is it because of wind? Right? We're, we're trying to gain understanding of the world through inductively looking at what's happening and deriving conclusions. So that, that's another common way that you'll see in research. The stuff that you all are interested in is slightly different. It requires a different way of thinking about the problem. And it also is a seen as a not necessarily a traditional view of research. So this design mindset, which if you all are interested in product development and this whole cycle of moving something out into a marketplace, whatever that is, whether that is a consumer marketplace, whether the, whatever the, the pieces are, requires sort of this, demind, this design mindset. And it's not so much in understanding what's going on, it is aspirational to solve a particular issue that has cropped up. Right? It's solution focused and action oriented towards creating a preferred future. So you look at the world, you see how it's working, and you see opportunities to develop something that solves a particular issue. And so it's a way of doing. Does that make sense? All right. And the, the characteristics of these design problems are, are such, you know, there's really, if you're looking for the translation of this esoteric stuff into something that is usable out in the world by someone, something, some place, that these, the, there are no defined conditions or limits. Right. No one tells you that, like, uh, unless you're, you know, you're working in some medical field where they put parameters around that. But, but there, there's really no one set of rule structure that guides you. You are inventing it as you're doing it. And there's no exhaustive list of operations. So I cannot go through a mathematical procedure to determine the best way to do this stuff. There's always new uh, parameters, there's new influences, there's new views, there's new context that requires me to change uh, a little bit differently. And the solutions, especially as they go out into the world and live as something, they depend on the perspective of the solver and the user. So I can create, we do a classic example of designing uh, a hanger in design uh, for beginning design students. And if we have 50 people in the classroom, they design 50 different hangers. Because it's based upon their knowledge, their perspective, their view of the world, that they see a hanger in that perspective. So if someone wears uh, a particular type of clothing like a dress, more frequently than not, they think about the world of a uh, hanger as facilitating hanging a dress more often than not. And so, you, so you're really having to adjust based on who's using it. Uh, and the, these are always unique. Um, and that the unique aspect of this is that the solver takes ownership of the solution. In research, we often think of repeatability and a group consensus and sort of this validation of our view from external folks that say that this is repeatable, it's defensible, it uh, handles the monster of sort of traditional research practice. In 
development of a product of some sort, you're taking ownership of that solution and you are then putting forth that out into the world with trying to get some validation, but at the same time you own it and it becomes nested in your belief system and your attitudes and your view of the world, which you can see can be both good and bad. All right. So, and so what this requires is this funky thing that you probably never learned about, which is abductive reasoning, right? And abductive reasoning is more on the creative side and the generation of things, which is we're trying, we have a what, a how, which leads to an aspiration. Like, what are we trying to actually do? What are we trying to make different? How are we changing it? And so therefore I then can, I can create a new what? It could be a web page, it could be a new medical product, it could be a process, it could be a standard, it could be a new law. I don't know. How do you encourage people to, uh, let's say, save more money? Right? We know that we have good validated data that shows people saving more money gives them more freedom, it gives them more opportunity. It helps them succeed more in the future, uh, allows them for a lot of flexibility. How do you do that? I don't know. It could be a campaign. It could be a website. It could be a whole education series. We could do the sort of stick method where we just require people to do it. We could do the carrot where we actually give them more money if that we match. So there's a, a lot of variety that is because you're generating an aspiration, it's so much different than, than this traditional view. So this whole area of design research, and then we'll kind of switch over to talking about sort of some, some practices and an example, is really a knowing, a way of knowing through doing. It is less living in here and more of a combination of living through your hands of making stuff through your heart and your head. Recognizing that you have your own perspective, you have your own view of the world, realizing the limitations and the strengths of that and your ownership of it. And so you make stuff, which is different than traditional science where you look at stuff. Does that make sense? And, and many of you, I, I was incredibly frustrated. You know, I studied philosophy uh, early on in my undergraduate career and I loved the, the work. I was just really disappointed at the, what it manifested itself. And it's like, I wrote a paper. It was like, that, that, it was unsatisfying to me because I had been building stuff always as a kid. And so then I found architecture and design. And it's like, oh, this is philosophy manifest in something. And so, Ah, I'm actually building something that is tangible, that I can hold, that I can feel, that other people can look at, that we can comment on. Uh, and, it, and it became uh, much more interesting to me. And I, I heard that also with some students who are in labs. It's like, all I do is run, you know, I, I run experiments and I study and I look at stuff and it, it, it's just not quite satisfying me. And so th this is this whole other area of, of knowing a way of knowing through doing and that by actually, you know, you're building knowledge as you investigate. All right. So just this, this last slide, and then we'll kind of switch to some examples of how this has played out. So in this sort of design thinking, uh, I would say these are the characteristics of it at a high level. So scientific thinking is a reductionist approach, right? It's seeking a single absolute truth through observation, repeatable observation. Uh, and it's breaking these complex systems into parts and examining those as separate from the whole, right? And you create truths, rules, which is a binary system. Now, I could go on and on and on about the failures of this. And I think one of the things, things that we're seeing in the world right now is a challenge to some of these assumptions. 
and how this plays out then our, in our worldview. Ever since the Renaissance, this has been the dominant view of our world, which has led to marginalization of communities, marginalization of ways of thinking, marginal ways, marginalization of ways of doing, marginalization of people in a variety of ways because it is seeking a truth. And by its nature, it is binary. It is neither a yes or a no. You either fit or you don't. Whereas this other design thinking systems approach, so, to, sorry, this other thing, then if you think about the products that you're interested in developing, products don't have a truth. They may fit with one group, they may not fit with another. They may fit for one context, they may not fit for another. So this system approach, which is really the foundation of design thinking is much more holistic. Right? And it's finding the right fit for changing context. So what you're looking for is not the ultimate end-all truthful solution. You're looking at examining the world, understanding it in a deep, meaningful way, and finding the best solution that fits for the context that you're currently in with the recognition that that's going to change very soon. And so you examine the entire system to see the relationships, patterns, and connections, and you generate options and possibilities, which is a spectrum, which may, you know, it's sort of like this ever change. You all have heard forever in beta, right? That, that's sort of at this sense, like it's just like, we're just learning as we're doing this stuff and we're understanding this broader thing. Now, what that means in this product development cycle is again, you are trying to find the best solution as you try to solve a particular problem, but you have to examine the broader world and its place in that in order to do that. All right. Any questions about that stuff so far? Okay, just uh, this, I'll, I'll leave it and then we'll jump to this, the, the couple uh, projects. So have you all heard the term cybernetics? No, I mean, it's been floated from a long time, but this, this concept and this science developed in the 40s. So now imagine you go back to missile systems that were being developed in the 40s, late 30s, mid 40s, uh, for defense purposes. And so you would launch these missile systems and this whole idea of controlling something that then leaves your direct interaction is kind of interesting. Like, what do you do? Uh, and so th there were all sorts of theories and uh, practices that developed as a result of this of like, okay, we, we, we have control over a missile when it's on the launch pad. As soon as it launches, we lose control. And what we're now doing based on a number of factors is we're nudging this thing into its destination. I can't, with the joystick, I can't do that. And even if I could, there are so many dimensions and factors pushing this thing, wind, uh, sun, pressure, just all these multi-dimension of inputs the only thing I can do is kind of nudge it in certain ways. So it developed this whole set of science. And so what I'm suggesting in this whole new world that we're living in is really we need to develop better skills in a cybernetic science sort of ways of how given the, the multitude of change Let's see change as a common, and that what we're doing is actually nudging things rather than controlling. And it changes the entire way that you look at the world and interact with the world and develop products. And when we engage in good conversation that has uh, deep meaning for both people, we're actually engaging in a cybernetic sort of uh, approach where people are being heard, there's a response, there's an understanding, and then a meaningful reflection back. Okay.
So I will skip through all of this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this project. So, so the majority of my work has been in uh, medical, although I've done some uh, cybersecurity and finance work. And it's really looking at complicated places where, where individuals are making decisions that have great importance. So one of the areas that we worked on was in the ICU. So the intensive care unit, if any of you all have been in there, you know is basically the mechanics workshop of a hospital. They, it is not really set for, you know, it, it, it's, it's set up for the docs, not for the patient. It is the highest level of uh, interaction that you'll have as a patient. There's typically two nurses uh, per, uh, or one nurse per two patients. Uh, they'll monitor them at 24 hours a day. And so there's a lot of uh, scrutiny on these particular patients. So we, we looked at this environment and as this rich, place, and I'll sort of walk you through our process and the, 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 what ended up happening with this. So this is kind of the, the high-level process that we did. We did basic research. So we went and observed. Now, we didn't observe it to find truth. We observed it to find what actually happens. And I'll give you some methods of how that's being done. But it was really to like, what is going on in this really complex environment that we don't know about? Then we take all that data and then we apply an analytical lens where we synthesize all of it to try to find meaning. And that meaning can be beyond the sort of tangible quantitative and it all, often involves also the qualitative. But what are people doing? What's kind of the workflow? What's the relationship between a physician and a nurse and a technician? How does that sort of all play out? Uh, and then we came up with some design, we validated it, conclusion, and then I'll tell you about how we moved that into the commercial market. So these research areas, we just did these contextual observations. We just sat literally for two weeks, 24 hours a day, and watched what was going on. Fly on the wall, sort of sitting there, just seeing what people did and trying to find meaning of it. We didn't assign meaning. We didn't place a structure of how it should be. We merely observed the way it was in all its greatness and all its failures. Uh, we then did this workflow mapping. We saw where people walked and the equipment that they interacted with the way that they documented the data and uh, looked at all of the, how they dealt with their patients, how they dealt with the family, et cetera. We then created a table that shows absolutely every interaction that the, an individual in the ICU had, not the patient, but a caregiver, care provider, did and the time frame, and then we coded that with like what type of interaction that was, what uh, uh, importance that had, and any other notes. Then we put all of this. So so great. We have some research now. Again, because we wanted to make a product. We wanted to validate this with the end user, which in this case were the care providers that were uh, in the ICU. So in that validation step, we put all of this on a wall within their break room in the ICU, and we left it for two weeks and had them change it. So we had all these different category headings and all the actions, and we might have sort of like medication management. And we would have all of the activities that we thought were associated with medical man uh, uh, medication management. And then we would have them rearrange it if it was wrong. So, you know, I guess that getting to some of your point about this product development, we were always trying to get feedback from the people who would use the tools that we develop into understanding their mental models so it fit within the context not us assuming the context, but actually deriving it from those folks. 
Now, in, in a traditional scientific approach, you're not doing that. You are much more oriented towards uh, running an experiment, seeing how it happens, right? You have a hypothesis. In this, we had, you know, I guess our hypothesis was these are the associations. Now you tell us what it's uh, meaning. So then we started clustering all of this data. We identified, because we were more digital technologists, we identified all the areas in yellow that some sort of digital technology could address. So you see, but thinking about the entire system, there are many things that are happening that we just didn't, we couldn't do anything about, we couldn't develop a tool, but were meaningful in where that tool sat within the ICU. Then we zoomed in a little bit more. And again, that's sort of like, I need medication reminders. Oh, that's cool, a tool to do that. I need to know what medications need to be administered at a certain interval. Well, we can do that, that's pretty easy. I need to administer medication to my patient. We can do that through infusion pumps and we can collect all the data that then would tell us what medications had been administered and what they would need to. Uh, I need to double check ordered medication information. We can do that electronically, right? And then there's others sort of like, oh, well, I, I retrieved my medications. At that point, we didn't have these automated systems that could deliver, but uh, those are now, so. Then we started this design process where we took all of that information Let's say from this guy, I need to know what medications need to be administered. And we put that into graphic representations and ways that we could show that. These are, this is a body outline. We could show what drugs were being given and where those drugs would have the most effect and give suggestions for what types of drugs. So we translated that complex stuff into actionable technology that would address it. Then we built hundreds and hundreds of screens, each time getting feedback from the end user. And then we made a final implementation and we tested it in the simulator uh, up at the, the hospital. Again, to continue to validate that this was important but to see in a complex environment could have actually solved the particular problem. Rather than an assumption that it would, we actually put it in and then measured what their performance was across several dimensions. Time to make a decision, accuracy of the decision, and uh, the implications of those decisions, and then usability, sort of like how easy was it for them to use this particular system. So. From this, let's see, yeah, that's on that project. So from this, what we did is we, you know, we have an interesting model. We have a small company. It's called Applied Medical Visualizations. And back in 2002, we were given $40,000. Here, I'll stop sharing. We were given $40,000 from one of our mentors up in the anesthesia department. And he gave us sort of this model. We were like, well, we, we have a cool product. We have some interest in it. And how do we move it out into the marketplace? And he said, okay, well, you have some technology. You now have uh, validated that it works. And you have some internal folks that think this would be really usable. Let's get a patent. So we were able to get several patents around a, a couple of ideas uh, through the university and the university supported that, uh, which they still do. And I'll give you some details about that. They, then he gave us $40,000 to license that technology from the university, essentially paying back the patent costs and then going out and with the data that we had collected about its use in a particular environment here, then go sell it. So then we went and sold it to a variety of medical manufacturers that we had contact with. And we basically pitched them. It's like, look, we have this really cool technology. We have data that shows that it's useful, effective, and it clearly solves a problem. 
you don't have it, we would like to partner with you. And that kind of started this cycle where we then would do basic research here at the university. We would then get a patent protection or a trademark or something. We would then license that away from the university or license it in partnership with the university. And then we would go off and sell it to uh, a variety of different partners. Uh, we continue to do that still. We're now working in sort of the education space in a variety of places, but utilizing sort of thinking about like, oh, we're going to go through this process and then we're going to move this out into uh, an environment where someone might pay for it or might be somewhere useful outside of the, the, the university. Now, there are a variety of entities on campus that support that in, in many different ways. Many of you all are familiar with Lausanne, right? And they, they, they're focused on doing that. They'll give you money to develop these ideas. Uh, there's the Pivot Center, which is a rebranding of the commercialization office for the university. They have many programs that will support you as students to, that have an idea to get some funding and then get support to uh, patent it, have some sort of protection, although you know we could argue whether that's totally useful or not, and then sort of move it out into a marketplace through some connections and other things. Um, trying to think. I, I mean, I guess that's it in essence of, of how you do that process. Any kind of questions you want to talk about something any bit more and anything come up? Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting and it's a great question. I think oftentimes it, it goes to this cybernetic sort of relationship. Oftentimes as a developer and as a product maker, you think what you have done is the best thing. You have a unique insight. You, you're smarter than everyone else. And, and so you go in with a way that you need to justify what your product is versus going in and sort of with a a listening ear and sort of an understanding of what they need to do as a company and what their product does and what they see value in what you're doing. And so it becomes much more of a listening exercise and a responding exercise than going in and detailing the 20 different things that uh, it could do. And, and it's an identification of what is the problem like, what is a problem that this company is having in this space? And tailoring your pitch, your discussion to hit that rather than a litany of features, which really no one cares about at that high level. Uh, there was this, I, I was just in a meeting yesterday, we had uh, a person from Frog Design. Uh, it was a, it's a global consultancy, a really big design firm that's done some really cool stuff. And he was the senior product designer. And, and he said what landed him his first job and his first sort of product was that he told a story about the issue of connecting with someone thinking about someone and the difficulty of connecting with that person and letting them know that you were thinking about them. And he talked about his partner and he was on the East Coast in New York and his partner was in Los Angeles. And he's just like, you know, there are a number of times during the day that I'm just thinking about my partner and I really wanted to let them know that I cared about them. And it was really laborious. Like I had to get on a phone, I had to do all this stuff. And so he created these really beautiful little cows I mean, they were really cute, sort of sitting in this pasture, and there are these little toys. And basically, he could touch it, and it in certain places, and it would send a certain message to the other cow in California, and it would play that 
kind of message and it would have like a specific little mood. And it would let that person know in a very cute way of what that, uh, that he's thinking about that person. And that they would know and then they could hit it back. And then there was like this really funny little moo exchange. But, and, and I say that because it, he said, when I pitched it that way, everyone in the room got it. They're like, I have someone who I love, who I care about, who is distant from me, that I would love to send a very quick little message to let them know that I care. He's like, they, they, they kind of like the moo analogy and the cuteness of it, but it was really that kind of story. So I think framing the stuff that you're doing in some meaningful way that gets at something beyond tech specs is much more important. Anything else? Because at the end of the day, like, you know, I, be honest, like that's, people want to see that stuff. And, you know, the, the, we can have all the sort of pessimism about corporate greed and selling stuff. But at the end of the day, people just want, you know, things that matter and that are meaningful and interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, the scientific, so yeah, with drug development, the scientific versus holistic thinking versus drug development. So drug development is very much and should be based in a rigorous clinical trial and understanding the, the repeatability and the analysis and the observation, right? But one thing that has happened before the particular aspects of, of the drug evaluation process, many drug manufacturers as well as inventors of drugs very much have a holistic mindset of thinking about the, the body system in a very complex interrelated way and thinking about a little bit alternatively of how they can target particular key things, right? And so I, I have a, a friend who's a, a geneticist up at uh, Oregon Health Sciences, and he and I chat about this and, and the sort of art. He is very much a scientist, and he would, you know, he, he is, he and I often get in clashes about the, the primacy of, of scientific thinking. But, but in the, the early stages and the latter stages, he very much acknowledges that it is his deep understanding of holistic systems in the uh, body and the way that we can target and the way that certain enzymes and certain characteristics of uh, things that we can do to the body uh, allow him to think about it differently and allow him to sort of creatively think about it. And without that complex understanding of this system and where we can interject some sort of intervention that doesn't have implications elsewhere while still thinking about this holism, uh, it makes it makes it much better. Then the other side of that is like, okay, now you have a drug that is effective at something. How within a complex system do you introduce this drug? Do you promote it? Do you have it used? And I, and I, you know, that's often referred to as marketing. I think that's sort of a crass term. I think how does it fit within a complex system and a complex human environment where people have particular belief systems? We saw it with uh, COVID, right? Regardless of the data, we could flood people with data and people are like, that's crap. I'm not going to do it. So the rational is always balanced with this emotional. And so as you're thinking about that stuff, and that's why I was trying to get at that sort of cow, you're getting at basic human needs rather than just the one side or the other. And you're kind of having to go back and forth between those two. And the better you can get at that, uh, I think the better your solutions will be, the more sort of benevolent and sort of, uh, 
you know, the good that you do for the world rather than just bombard people with just sort of like, this is good for you. Like, at some point, no one wants that. Like if someone told me what's good for me, like you need to exercise more and here's all the data. Well, we know that and people don't exercise more. I don't know, there's something deeper there. Yeah, anything else? And, and again, I, I, this is stuff that we don't talk about with sort of products. We, we oftentimes lump it into a capitalistic greed system that is there to make money. And no doubt there are some horrible capitalistic greedy uh, individuals that are pushing product and the whole marketing stuff. But there's also like this unbelievably beautiful thing about creating something that solves a problem. Like there is something so deeply meaningful that if you can change someone's life for the better, you could change the environment's life for the better through a simple intervention that is manifest in some sort of product you think. Like that's pretty, it's pretty meaningful activity. And especially done with kindness and sort of regard for all of these implications and the radiation outward, I, it, you know, I think it's really uh, deeply satisfying and meaningful work, and you know, quite uh, quite needed. So the other thing I just want to bring up for for you guys, since you're your students, is the what Lassonde. Uh, uh, they have uh, pitches, it's every month. And I don't know if any of you know that, but they will give you anywhere from 500 to $10,000 for a good idea. And basically you go in and the, it's, you pitch your idea and no strings attached. They're like, that's a great idea. Here, what do you need to develop this further? We'll give you this amount of money. It's a really remarkable system to think about. And I think to think about if you're doing undergraduate research of how to translate some of that into product or something else with some of your faculty advisors. And it might be something that your faculty advisor has just not even thought about of, of translating that work into something else outside, you know, it's product sort of some manifestation of something. You all have anything else? All right. Well, with that, you will have my email, I think. I will, I'll give you my email. Happy to meet with you all uh, in any way to chat about this more, to think about entrepreneurship options at the university, to think about product development uh, and how you might move something forward, how you might get money, how you might get validation. I'm happy to help with any of that. Really appreciate you spending the time. I know you're busy and got a bunch of stuff going. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.